one thing I learned, like you should always do multi-stage modeling, not just, Mm. Hey, I'm going to do the most complex advanced thing out there and throw it in production. I always start at a base base regression because if the regression model breaks, you're in trouble. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Data Scientist Show. Today, we have Nathan Lundy. Nathan is a staff machine learning engineer turned principal knowledge expert of quantitative research at tech systems. Previously, he was a senior data scientist at JP Morgan. He's on the advisory board of ML Ops World. He studied applied science and horse reproduction management in college and later got a master's degree in software engineer from Harvard. In today's episode, we will talk about his approach in tackling difficult machine learning problems, his career journey, how he transitioned from a background in business to a machine learning engineer. And if you like the show, subscribe to the channel and give me a five-star review, and I will really appreciate that. Welcome to the show, Nathan. Hi, happy to be here. Yeah, so um, you studied horse reproduction, later became a data analyst. Can you tell us how you made a transition? Yeah, it kind of was all by accident, as always. So I used to be a pro athlete, and I used to ride horses professionally, and be pre, uh, pre-Olympic. And um, I also like studied horse reproduction. So I was into all the genetics and breeding and yeah. um, used to do some really cool stuff. And so like when the horse industry collapsed in about, it happened about 2010-ish, 9, 10, right after the 2008 market crash, everybody was getting rid of their horses. So the industry just fell apart and collapsed. So I was like, I need to get out before something happens. So I was like, okay, well, I'm really good on the business side of things. Let me go back and study business. So I studied business, um, saw that my background in like biology and applied sciences worked really well in like qualitative research. And so Mm -hmm. I started working in uh, qualitative research for marketing. And then from there, I um, slowly transitioned into a data analyst role using those sort of like step by step because you kind of learn the scientific method in um, like a lot of biology and everything. And so that's very applicable to data science. And back then, data science wasn't really huge or, you know, a thing when I was uh becoming a data analyst. So I just was interested. Mm-hmm. I really liked working with data. I thought it was interesting um, what you can get from it, seeing from how I got it from the qualitative side. Yeah, um, that's very interesting. And so then you transitioned to do um, marketing analytics and uh, um, you probably learned some data science. So did you, before you did your master's degree, did you learn data science just through a work project? Did you took any online courses? It's, it's actually kind of funny because um, a lot of people think like you have to have these amazing degrees and stuff to get into data science. But I mm-hmm. got into data science doing um, the Coursera Johns Hopkins certification in data science. I think it's really good. The teachers are really good. And I actually got recruited um, through that. So that's like how I got into JP Morgan Chase. So I was doing a bunch of like wow. freelance projects. And then my manager at the time, which I always uh, give like kudos to Shannon Mata, she was the one who mm-hmm. pulled me into JP Morgan Chase. Um, yeah. and she found me in the forums answering questions on like data science. So I was like in Coursera, in the Coursera forum. Yeah. In the Coursera forum. So she would sign up, um, for these courses too. Cause a lot of people don't realize people go in there from companies and use it. And then if they see you mm-hmm. answering questions in the forum and stuff, they're like, this person knows stuff, you know, I'm looking for wow. with this. Yeah. So then they pull in. So I've seen a few people I've met have had the same sort of experience where they've been recruited in through Coursera, um, Mm -hmm. answering the forum questions and such of other students and, and things. Yeah. Uh, that's a great story. And thanks for sharing that experience. And by the way, that's how we met. You commented on my post and I thought you had a, uh, you know, great perspective and, uh, yeah, why don't we do a podcast? 
So share your work, share your thoughts, and、uh, you don't have to be an influencer, but it's okay to express your opinion, and that's how people、uh, see you. And then if you share something in common, or if they're looking for a candidate,、uh, you know, you're opening up to an opportunity this way. Exactly. Exactly. So then、um, you did went to grad school. So what is that、uh, thought process? So I wanted. I saw how、um, working in finance, you're around very, very smart people,、um, and I wanted to get to where some of the smarter data science applications were being done.、Um, so I felt like I had gaps in my knowledge because a certificate is really good, but it doesn't give you the full. Depth、um, that you need to get into some of the higher level, like understanding the math, like very、mm-hmm. in depth and the stats in depth. So it's something that I saw. Like I have these skills that I need to develop. How do I do this? So I applied to grad schools, and to my shock, I got into Harvard because I wasn't expecting it. And then,、mm-hmm. um, yeah, I just、But、you still applied. Yeah, I applied.、Right? It never hurts、yeah. to apply, and I I got in、yeah. and. I was a. I just took courses like because、um, their masters is very malleable. They let you kind of select from、yeah. like, all right, select from here, select from here, select from here, and、mm-hmm. so I was able to take a lot of electives in theoretical computation. So that's where、mm-hmm. I was able to get like a lot of in-depth, hardcore math and stats, which I think has helped me a lot in developing my career.、Um, yeah, I think taking that and. Combining like the the analytical approach with the business mindset was the area、yeah. that really excelled my career because a lot of people either、mm-hmm. know the business side or the the math and stats really in depth. But when you put them together and it's like, all right, now I know how to solve a problem, what to、mm-hmm. do, and then the math and stats and the techniques that go with it, you can、mm-hmm. your career will like go off really like quickly. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I don't think you need a master degree to get into data science. You can do that through a lot of uh, um, online learning, self learning,、um, and uh, um, if you want to learn more um, advanced um, you know programming skills or statistics,、uh, I think you can also do that through self learning. But if you have the Um, you know, time and budget.、Uh, I don't think it's a bad idea to go to grad school. It's an option.、Um, you just need to evaluate whether it's it's、uh, fit for your career journey. Exactly. And there's a lot of open source、yeah. uh, stuff out there too, like MIT、uh, OCW. They have all their、mm-hmm. like stats and math, like or other things. So it's like if you're on a project and you need to know linear algebra, you can just go in and watch like lectures from MIT, and you'll get everything. So、um, now let's talk about your job as a machine learning engineer. So, what is your day to day like? Yeah. So, like my current job, like in quantitative research, is a very interesting day to day because no day is the same.、Mm-hmm. Um, but in general, it's a lot of looking at and understanding processes and the data you're in. Because what quantitative research is, is more of like the applied research side, where what you、yeah. want to do is I look for、um, like signals or、um, certain regressors or techniques out there that can basically boost what data scientists already are doing. So my job is、mm-hmm. to go in there and like take、um, models that are already developed, put in production, and enhance them through additional data sources, through New techniques out there, through additional signals or regressors in the time series.、Um, mm-hmm. so、the, that's in my nutshell what I kind of do. So I go out there, I explore the data, I talk to people to understand the processes that go into the data and the context. I'll do some causal inference on it to understand the relationships between all the variables out there and our predictor,、mm-hmm. and to really understand how everything fits together from the the context perspective. Uh, yeah, and then integrate it in.、Mm-hmm. And、uh, how is that different from your previous job as a、um, machine learning engineer?、Uh, an ML engineer was different because both these are more specialty data science roles. 
Mm -hmm. Um, the, as a machine learning engineer, it was more on the production side. So it was more of building out pipelines, um, to deploy models, deploying models and testing them and making sure that they work correctly in production data. Cause that's always a big thing when you roll the from test data over to production data, there's always mm -hmm. breaks. Um, so it's that it's monitoring the models and also looking at like the decisions, um, like metrics behind the models to not only seeing how they're performing, but also like from the business side, how those are performing. And then a lot of my work was also taking current like low level models. I would go into companies and help mm -hmm. them move that from like a basic regression type model into the world of machine learning. So getting the data curated and ready, getting everything ready that you need, the the environment to have the performance power to run the ML models mm -hmm. at the time schedule they want and everything. It's more on the yeah. production side of the data science. Got it. Yeah. And uh, you previously mentioned when you go from test data to production, there's always going to be some issues. So can you share some challenges, um, common challenges like engineers facing and uh, how did you tackle that? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is just, as every data scientist knows, data quality. Mm -hmm. It's like the thing we wrestle with the most, and I always tell people that's the most you can invest in. Um, so yeah. when you move from test data, your test data is pretty, usually because it's a small subset of like what you're running stuff on, um, mm -hmm. your validate and your training set. When you move to production data, you get all kinds of things you would never expect. So if you're inputting like, let's say, um, data in from anywhere, uh, you'll always like have issues where for some reason, uh, the data that was supposed to be numeric has letters in it or something like something weird or oddball and it will break the model because suddenly it's yeah. like, Oh, this was not the data that we expected because we never saw this in our, our sample we pulled to build test validate the model on. So like mm -hmm. none of that was there. So when you roll into production, you have that. You also have data outages where sometimes it's like, oh, the data is not being collected. Well, the model's not going to run if there's no data to go in it. Or yeah. um, sometimes the environment's down. Like an, um, like if you have like a uh, some sort of like environment, pro there's all different sort of things. I like it because you're like basically like the data science doctor in a way. You have to go through diagnosis, <laughs> fix it and like kind of like uh, remedy the situation, but you have to do it like really quickly. Like you're in the ER, like, you know, cause it's production. Yeah. So they need the outputs like ASAP usually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you have any framework or uh, mental models, like things you always check, um, during this process? Yeah. Um, so usually I, and I, it's, I kind of like use it the same mental model, when I go through and check in quantitative research too, when I'm like looking for like data sets when I go in. So I look at like the mm -hmm. data. Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, the yeah. people, the processes, because sometimes mm -hmm. it can be a process break. Um, mm -hmm. It can be someone let, like this has happened before. Um, the people involved. So I always get the people involved with the data because sometimes it's like, oh, well, this person left the company. That's why it broke because he was manually doing something um, mm. process. And now he's not here and no one knew he was doing yeah. it. So now it right. breaks. So it's like always people, process and data are like the three things that I always look at mm. um, to understand. Yeah. Sometimes the context too, the context can help mm -hmm. you. Um, when you get a model handed to you and let's say you're putting in production and you didn't build the model, sometimes you, you have to get the context of why the model was built so you can make sure that you're getting that, what the data scientist intended the model to be outputting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that because a lot of times we think about production, we just think about data and a model, but there are a lot of people involved, right? Yeah. Especially you mentioned context. Did this person build a model or they're just applying it? So you understand in that process, in that specific point, how strong it is, right? Exactly. Um, thanks for sharing that. And uh, previously, you also mentioned doing some causal inference for your model. Can you share more about um, how you did a causal analysis? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, I think, one of the strongest things out there right now. And I can see it being um, with a lot of black boxing of models that are out there where people are putting things in production and you end up like Zillow where you're, you're putting things out there, but you don't know why you're putting things out there predicted well, but I don't know. So causal inference is a really good bridge. So what you're looking at is you're taking a step back from the model and you're just looking at the explainability of relationships between things. Why Mm -hmm. are some variables like pulling together? Why are some pushing apart? Why are some grouping together? Um, so it's just a lot of stats and there's actually some like causal inference models that you can build. Um, and these will add a layer of explainability on your current model. So this is what you would do in like the pre-modeling stage when you're going through Mm -hmm. and you're looking at like, not only like correlations and covariance and like information values and like other sort of, um, things that could add to, does this add to my model or detract from it? the causal inference will be looking more at the relationship level, um, Mm -hmm. which is good for my job where I have to integrate data into, let's say, um, a model that I didn't build. So if I have a model and I have to integrate data into it, I have to understand, like, how do these work and fit together? Is it going to blow up the model? Um, Mm -hmm. Is it something that's actually going to add or is it going to detract? Yeah. Um, I think that's also a very important part that sometimes we don't pay attention to. We just kind of quickly want to run a model, see the results, and uh, we don't know what happened, whether we got lucky. Um, so what are some tools or packages you use for causal inference? Um, well, there's some like really good ones in R. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I do with causal inference, I tend mm-hmm. to just, I pre-built my own libraries in a way. I'm, I'm very oh, popular. Wow. So what I do is I, when I go in and I just sort of have like, I know what I'm going to run and I know what I'm going to do and I'm going to have to do it every Mm -hmm. time. I build things in a very modular way. So no matter what, you just have to put the data source in and the variables you Mm -hmm. list and then it runs everything else. Um, But Mm -hmm. there's like some really, really good books on causal inference out there that explain everything at a very good level. Um, Mm -hmm. Some are more as usual, very stats. Some are more topical level, which are good because it's like sometimes the stats are too much and it's like, okay, well, I understand like from a statistical side, but how is this applicable from um, like a actual application side? You know what I mean? I want to see it being used so I understand how to use it. And so Mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of, I mean, a lot of the stuff I get is from books and also from a lot of people's blog posts. A lot of people will show how mm-hmm. they implemented it. So I'll go through and I'll look at like, okay, well, these are like techniques that they've used. This is um, how they've seen things. This is the data they're using. And how is this applicable to what I'm doing? Yeah. Wow, that's great. So then you learn from the books or blog posts you implemented on your own. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, um, are there some blog posts or books you can recommend here? Yeah, there's a really good book that I've been kind of like drawn to. And let me Mm -hmm. find it. Uh, Yeah, Yeah. it's Elements of Causal Inference, Mm -hmm. uh, Foundations of Learning Algos. Mm -hmm. And it's um, by Jonas Peters, Dominic uh, Janzig, and um, Bernard uh, Scholkloff. Okay. Yeah. It's a really Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Do you do all your machine learning work in R? Uh, so it's a combination. For me, it's mm-hmm. I'm tool agnostic, especially on quantum yeah. research, because sometimes you'll mm-hmm. get a model in R, sometimes you'll get a model in Python. So you have to, oh. you have to adapt to what they're doing. And you mm-hmm. learn that kind of right. as a machine learning engineer, too. That's like an area you have to be ready for. And sometimes mm-hmm. it's a model that's in something totally different. Like I've gotten a model handed to me in um, like built in OCaml. So it's like you've got a totally different language. Um, So you have to be ready to understand and like be ready to to learn and see how you can add in and such. So I'm Mm -hmm. about building a library that then you can like plug in um, through Java or something like that. Um, Yeah. But it all depends. Like uh, sometimes I'm in Python, sometimes I'm in R. It really depends on Mm -hmm. the that built the model and the use case. 
That makes sense because I think there are a lot of debate around R or、um, Python, but I think it's、uh, it's good to have both in your toolkit. And if you only know one, that's okay too, and it's not hard for you to get into another.、Um, I'm just curious、uh, from the production perspective. After you、um, build a model, do the research, R or Python, which one is easier、um, when you think about machine learning, kind of ML ops or production? Oh, it really depends. It really depends. I mean, this could go either way. I mean, the cleanest sort of one is like if you get someone who can write in C plus <laughs> plus, <laughs> <laughs> because those are、yeah. like you know that's like a, a language that was made for production. But、um, mm -hmm. yeah, it really just depends. I mean, it depends on the pipeline you built. You have to have the right pipeline. And if you、mm -hmm. have the problem is is sometimes like when I worked in、um, like in finance for like J P Morgan Chase, Wall Street has set up、um, set pipelines. So you tend to have to learn the language that the pipeline does. So、yeah. if you have a Python pipeline for implementation. You're stuck、mm -hmm. using Python on that team, or if they、yeah. if they're an R shop, you're stuck using R. Mm -hmm. When you're on the ML side, it's interesting because some ML people are like, "This is what I built, and this is what you're using." I've always been like, "Well, it wouldn't be difficult for me to build a new one, and why aren't there multiple?" You know what I mean? Everybody、yeah. should have the option because sometimes you run into a problem where you're like, "All right, I'm using R, and this package is only in Python, or I'm using Python, and this package doesn't exist in R, and I really would need it for this project, so I have to switch." And that's why I'm、mm -hmm. like, you know, we should really move away from this R versus Python and move to a more more tool agnostic sort of viewpoint. Yeah, I'm glad you、uh, mentioned that. And、uh, so, for folks who are not familiar with R, what are some libraries in R that is better than those in Python, or like doesn't exist in Python? For example, I know like time series, yeah, some time series models, right? Blows like, out of the water. R blows、yeah. out of the water.、Um, mm -hmm. Python, Python is really good when you're dealing with like data structure, more algo side of like modeling. Where、mm -hmm. when you're on in R, it's very stats and very quant driven. Because、um, yeah. those are the most people that use it, like biostatisticians and、um, quant analysts.、Right. So, economists, yeah. yeah, economists use a lot of R. So when you get in there, there's a lot of econometrics、um, that are really good. A lot of like、uh, if you're getting into like the pre modeling, like. When you get into like information value and looking at the information in an attribute, there's a lot more libraries in R, where Python、mm -hmm. I've kind of struggled with some pre-modeling stuff where you have to build it yourself.、Um, yeah, Python works a lot,、um, tends to work a lot better when you're running into、um, a lot of the deep learning area, especially when、mm -hmm. you get into like、uh, computer vision and NLP. Um, mm -hmm. R has some good like、uh, libraries, but Python、yeah. has a lot of libraries. Yeah, in some some deep learning those、uh, domains, CV and LP, I also find、uh, it's just easier to use Python, especially、uh, you know combined with like PyTorch if that's some tool you use. Um, but yeah, I think people kind of overlook the values in R. If you want to do more like deep dives to understand your model, causal inference,、um, definitely、um, take a look at R packages. So it's、uh, very interesting. You mentioned the pre-modeled part. I think a lot of times when we do pre-model, how we call it the EDA, we, we plot some uh, uh, you know bar charts. But I think you mentioned something kind of a, a little bit more technical. You look at the information value,、uh, maybe related to kind of、uh, information theory. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah. So when I do, so I split because、um, when I was like a quant scientist at like J.P. Morgan Chase, like you're、mm. there working with other statisticians, so you learn a lot of their techniques. And one of their techniques that I found most beneficial when building models was splitting out the EDA part 
from yeah. the actual pre-modeling. So the pre-modeling, I go through and I look at the stats. So you're not only looking at like mean, median, mode and stuff. You're looking at like the mm-hmm. deciles. You're looking at your inter- interquartile ranges. You're you're looking at what you would normally look in a, a basic stats, but then I go even mm-hmm. deeper and I go into like, okay, what's their weight of evidence, information value um, towards the regressor, uh, like for each regressor towards the predictor. And then is there also like other information that you can get from that actual attribute? There's a lot of like pre-built packages or a lot of people have implemented it in R and Python um, that mm. you can go out there. But what I've done is like I've said, like in some other things, like I've built like my own module where it, it comes in, you drop the data in, it takes each column, it's like loops through it, um, puts mm-hmm. them all up against each other, and you can see the information overlap. So your information value is seeing how much of this information is in here. So you're looking at the overlap, um, mm-hmm. which really helps when you get into post-modeling too, because you're, you're trying to understand like, hey, I put this ML model together. So I combine some traditional techniques that a statistician or uh, traditional quant would use with um, some of the the things that a normal ML person would use um, on mm-hmm. the more progressive side. So that way it's like I get, I do the explainability before and after. Yeah, that's, that's great. Uh, I actually, I think the first guest of this podcast theory, he has a uh, he's an AI researcher in a startup, also a professor at uh, UC Berkeley. He talked about using uh, information theory to look at the data and then build a model. So every time he, uh, it's like kind of auto ML, but very data centric. Uh, you look at the data and then you decide which sometimes you do some uh, decide what uh, features you use, and then you can build a model more efficiently instead of treating every feature uh, equally when you build a model. Exactly, exactly. Information theory is one area, especially after this whole Zillow debacle um, where yeah. they had their models run out of control. I feel like it's an area that can add a lot to your modeling. Information uh, theory and also um, like the causal inference side, those can boost mm-hmm. your modeling performance so much, especially when you're at yeah. that point where you're like, I'm stuck, I've done everything, and I'm still getting this certain performance. Yeah. Like, how do I boost? How do I, like, not only that, explainability. So, you know, especially like working in Wall Street, everything has to go to regulators. So the models that I had to build um, had to be very explainable because if they're not, you can get fined. Um, yeah. So you have to be very thorough in when you're putting something in production. Mm-hmm. I do not yeah. miss 200 page documentations like to do on <laughs> documentation is so important. Um, it's very important, but 200 page it would like be out of control for regulators. Yeah. Wow. Um, and, uh, yeah, so for also information theory, I think that there are a lot of things, uh, materials, it's pretty hard for a lot of people to understand. Have you found anything like easy to um, understand or some books, tutorials or R packages? So what I did was I started very basic and I got an information value, um, book and started going through it. And I wouldn't understand a lot of the concepts. It's very different. Information theory is very different than what normal, like what a a standard data scientist comes across. It's very abstract. And so Mm -hmm. when you get into it, I would just start like, well, I I don't really understand this. So I would just Google, honestly. I mean, I do that a lot. Most of my days Googling and looking up. (laughs) Uh, Can someone explain this in an explainable manner? And then, okay, now that I understand it, Let me see if someone has actually applied this. Like, how are they using Mm. this? Because it's like, now I understand this concept, but I don't understand how it's being applied. And so, like, Mm. usually Googling those things helps a lot. And there's a lot of, with um, so many people putting their ideas out there, there's there's a lot of projects you come across where people are are using these techniques now. Mm Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, and sounds like you learned a lot during your uh, time at JP Morgan. Can you share more about um, some high impact project you worked on and uh, some lessons you learned from there? 
Yeah, yeah. I've I've worked on like a lot of projects, a lot of projects at JP Morgan Chase. Um, mm-hmm. Everything from NLP to OCR to real time modeling, which is like a big lesson that I've learned. Real time modeling is totally mm-hmm. different than your normal game because your models have to retrain and retune and the model deterioration is very fast um, Mm -hmm. because you're trying to do something in real time. And usually when you're doing that, that means it has to run like every, uh, every couple of minutes, your models rerunning um, to make sure. And that was more on personalization. So when you're doing personalization at like a real time level, where if I were to go in now compared to five minutes later, it would look different based on what I did the last time. It's like, uh, your models deteriorate really fast. So you have to be really, really careful. And like a lot of people want to use a lot of things that like Kegel uses Mm -hmm. models. Like it's very advanced. It's very cool. But the yeah. problem is, is when your model deteriorates so quickly, like something like XG boost or something that gets really good predictors, uh, yeah. people will realize like when you put that in production, it deteriorates like really, really, really fast. So you get mm. like your best results you're ever going to get in machine learning is the first time you run it in production. Then from there, it only goes down. And then you yeah. got to figure out like, where is my point of rebuild? Like, when do I have to rebuild the model? So you have to, like, have those and set those firing mechanisms ready. And that was, like, one thing I learned. Like, you should always do multi-stage modeling, not just, Mm. hey, I'm going to do the most complex, advanced thing out there and throw it in production. I always start at a base, base regression because if the regression model breaks, you're in trouble. Like you're in trouble if that thing's breaking because that means nothing to and like to roll back on. So I always do that. Then I'll get into a more advanced technique. Then I'll add the ML in once I have enough data and knowledge and then I'll start Mm -hmm. building up. But I always have in case that you have to roll back because like the one thing I did, I learned was I was working when COVID first hit in consumer banking. That totally messed the markets were like haywire. And it's like, what are you doing? All our models are breaking. Every model we have in production is blowing up. What do we do? We had to roll Mm -hmm. everything back. Luckily, we built multi-stage so we can roll back to a base regression because in volatile markets, simple models work better than more complex. Yeah. Um, So it's always good to have those on the back burner running and benchmarking, always benchmarking your models. And if if one, if they flip, that is a point mm-hmm. where you send a flag and you, you're like, okay, this needs rebuilt and we need to switch out our models. The one in production being used has to be this one now because it's performing yeah. better than the more advanced one, which is deteriorated. Yeah, that's a really good approach. So basically you build multiple models and then you set the decision. Okay, if the uh, say the s- second model outperformed the first one based on the benchmark data, I'm going to make that switch automatically. Um, and uh, so you make that decision beforehand. And then because in reality, the real time model, things can change really fast. Very fast. So you have to have those ready, those decisions. So you have to, yeah. that's where the ML ops comes in because they will write those programs yeah. to flag to flip things out based on metrics. Like that's what the ML mm-hmm. ops side is all about. Like making sure those models can run in production. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, how did you make the decision that um, how to pick those uh, benchmark? Uh, so the benchmarks really depend on the model that you're doing. They're not only like modeling benchmarks, like you're looking at your basic, like um, precision, accuracy, recall, um, mm-hmm. like I look at a lot of error metrics too, you know, if you're in time series, your W WMAPE and stuff like that. Um, but when you're going through a lot of times, it's also business, the business side, because you can have a model. Like, I think that was one area that Zillow missed. They may have had yeah. modeling metrics saying, yes, we're doing really good, but they forgot you, you don't only have modeling metrics, you have business metrics. So if the mm. business metrics, so that like, Hey, my personalization like engine, it's doing great on the performance metrics. It's doing wonderful, but on the business metrics, it's tanking and we're hemorrhaging money. That's when you have to yeah. know to pull the plug too. Yeah. 
Um, that's a very important part. I think a lot of times when we think about machine learning, we think about those, you know, accuracy and sometimes also hard to measure the impact, right? Because maybe my model improves some processes. It doesn't really tie it to a dollar amount. I mean, sometimes it does, yeah. sometimes it doesn't. So like, so when you are facing a new business problem, how do you find out those uh, business metrics and how do you tie that to your model? So the, the, fir- the one thing I've learned that helps me the most is I go through and I meet with the SMEs of the, the business side. So I, mm-hmm. before I even touch modeling or anything, as soon as I get like, here's my use case, here's what I'm doing. I go straight yeah. to business and I go, okay, who are their subject matter experts? Who's their SMEs there? And mm-hmm. I go and meet them and I say, what are you currently doing now? What are you currently using? What are your current metrics? And what makes your business successful? Because that's one mm-hmm. huge thing. Because like, how do you yeah. gauge success? Because that's what in the end, my model is going to be using those same things to gauge success. So Mm-hmm. You know, it's very different than, you know, looking at your F1 score and saying this is really good. Yeah. That, that doesn't work for the business because if you have, let's say, um, inventory or something that you're building mm-hmm. a model for and it falls below, but your model's still running great, you're going to have issues that, I mean, and this is one thing I've been dealing with my side working on, like uh, the demand side of Mm -hmm. like operations right now how do you deal with these covid fluctuations and volatility in the market Mm -hmm. thanks for sharing that yeah so how do you deal with the fluctuation (laughs) i mean honestly it's been looking at um simpler models of things and doing things on a shorter time scale in time series so a lot of the things Mm -hmm. i've been doing has been more around um just like doing simpler sort of modeling than doing like Mm -hmm. crazy sort of stuff. So I'm doing more, more Markov chain modeling and, you know, especially like hidden Markov chains have been like really really helpful in some areas that I've been doing. But, Mm -hmm. but not only that, doing some things like basic, like combining, starting with like, let's say like a Poisson model or something similar, very simple model, adding that hidden Mm -hmm. Markov chain onto that. Boom you're suddenly at a more advanced model that performs well because it's a classical technique. And then once you feel like, you know, you have enough, like also shortening your windows and horizons you're looking at, because if it's very volatile, you don't want to be predicting off of like a larger, like you're going to be looking at data that's not really like relevant. You want to be looking at like, um, especially like if you're looking at like for retail or something in a season, you want to be looking like very close together. You don't want to be like looking far out because you you can't plan that with COVID. It will be by yeah. the time you order that inventory, it'll be sitting in a container, and then you'll mm-hmm. miss the whole season. That's a great approach. I think adding the complexity, you know, layer by layer, is better than I just put everything in a, a deep learning model and then adding more layers. Right? Exactly. This way by building kind of relatively simple model layer by layer, you're adding the complexity and you know exactly what you're doing, right? What is the impact for the outcome of your model? So um, I know you worked as a a data science um, kind of consultant working with different type of industry projects. Can you tell us when you're facing a new project Um, from the beginning to end to understand the business data collection, what is your entire, uh, machine learning, uh, workflow look like? Oh my God. It's, it's usually when you first come in, it's understanding what's currently there, what's currently being Mm -hmm. used, their current tech stack, their, basically current processes, current everything that they're doing. Um, yeah. and that's like usually when you go in, cause every, every company is different. Every company has its own different, um, techniques. They have their own sort of modeling styles. Every company will be totally different, um, totally different tool sets. Um, so everything will be totally different when you come in the door. So the first thing is I survey the land. I always say like, before you build a house, you have to survey the land. So I have to like, see what's out there. 
Um, and then the next thing is I, I check all of these things like, okay, well you have these models out there. Like how are you building these models? Like what techniques are you using? What decision sciences are you using for like deciding when a model is good, when it's bad? Um, Mm. how are you working with the business? Um, some, some people work in a, I'm going to build it and force the business to use it. Some people are, I'm going to first meet with the business, then build the model and then have them test it. There's very different working styles of how people model. So it's understanding that, um, everything they're currently doing. And then from there I go in and I say like, okay, where can I innovate? And I always look at like, Mm -hmm. where are the small wins? Because the small wins are the areas that you can gain traction and also yeah. um, trust and believability from your stakeholders. You know, you don't want to, if there's like, hey, we want you to move rocks and there's like a small rock here, like that's mm-hmm. like, you know, it has a, a, a pretty good impact behind it. It will do well for the business. I'm not going to take the boulder and try and roll it up the hill when I can take this rock that's in, like a, a pretty good size and take it up to the top and say, look, I can move rocks. Trust me. Um, yeah. You know, because otherwise you'll like destroy things be, before you even get started. So like working with your client is the number one and being fully transparent. I'm fully transparent. Yeah. with And if I'm saying like, listen, this is blowing up. This isn't working. I'm, I'm totally upfront with them. This is not working. This, mm. this is blowing up. And, and certain things are more, are harder to get into than other projects. Like I think um, like the, the time series projects that I've had um, working more on like demand planning and those sort of sides, retail and such that I'm working in now of like markets, emerging markets and stuff. Those have been easier than going in and diving into fraud. Uh, mm. when I worked in like risk and fraud and forensics, yeah. that area is much harder because you feel like you're in constant competition, every project, not with other data scientists or anything like that, but the people that are trying to break in to steal information and stuff, because as fast mm. as you're modeling to get ahead, yeah, they're yeah. coming in and they already know what you're doing and they're a step ahead. Mm-hmm. So you're always trying to figure out how can I identify because like when you work in like time series, like of retail and, and, and like demand planning, you're in the center of the curve. That's what you, you primarily look at when you're in fraud and risk, mm-hmm. you're on the tails of the curve. So you're out here yeah. looking at like the extremities. Where can I find mm-hmm. something that's irregular? Are these robot like, are these bots out there opening bank accounts? Are yeah. these um, people trying to commit fraud? Like you're trying to understand that. And some things are like as easy as looking at age. Uh, Like, you know, looking at the age variable is a key indicator because like, you know, how many 104 year olds are opening bank accounts? You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of basic stuff like that, but also like look at your emulators on your phone. Like, uh, like, you know, some people will, they'll open an emulator. Like, so it's like, how do we detect if this is an actual phone or an emulator? So it's going mm. through and like looking at that in and and understanding how to identify. So it's it's really understanding the business and understanding what they're doing and translating that over to the data science side. And that's how you become successful mm. is mainly listening yeah. to the business. Right. That's that's um, why I get frustrated when I see a lot of people that are like, uh, oh, I do Kegel and that's that's like my my Bible. And I'm like, Kegel is mm. like good if you're researching an approach. Yeah. But one, it's not production ready, that model. And two, there's no business partner on that. You have wow. to work closely with your business partners to be successful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think earn trust is such an important topic. And it's funny that you talk about having small wins. I think it's also the same thing applies for someone who just become a new CEO or even the president. Their strategy is always, can I have some small change, small policy just to earn trust from, you know, the, the, the uh, stock, the investors or, you know, the, the voters, right? Um, I think it's the same for data science, data science. Um, it's not like, uh, like politics, but you're working with people. Eventually you want to get buy in from the business. So this is a, 
some strategy you can do to earn trust from people. Because if you're just diving a six month project, people don't know what you're doing. Maybe on their side, their strategy, they quietly deprioritize the, the project, take away some resources. So you need to give them kind of, uh, you don't have to give them the like weekly update, but keep them in a loop and, uh, uh, share small wins, having that momentum, keep them, you know, excited. Sometimes I need to think about how can I make sure the business is still excited in this project, right? Um, and uh, you do need to make some trade-offs sometimes. You don't want to just always working on those small wins because that takes time. And you also want to make sure you have time to invest in some complex, uh, like you mentioned, uh, at some point you're going to decide when you want to do something um, innovative. So how do you balance those kind of small, s- small things, low hanging fruit versus, you know, innovation? Yeah, so it's it's very tough, especially working like the quant research side where people are like, all right, well, we want innovation, but we don't want innovation in a way. <laughs> they're very much like that, like uh, where yeah. they're like, we want to innovate, but we want to focus on um, like they people either want to innovate to the max mm-hmm. or they want to their level of innovation is like we want to innovate very, very smallly, like very, very yeah. tiny, like innovation. Um, so what I usually do is I usually put in front of them a multi-step plan. That's usually what I always do. Here's A, B, and C. Like here's my crawl state where I'm at. Here's my walking state. Here's my running state. And then here's Mm -hmm. where we're basically flying. The crawl state is the most important because that's where you're setting the framework of how do I go through and actually get buy-in for my project. How do I make them trust me enough to do more advanced innovation? And that's where you have to be very receptive to what they're doing. Keep them very, very close to you. Listen very closely. When you hit the Mm -hmm. walk stage, that's where you can start to push them a little bit. So like a little, because innovation is also like very change management where you have to push people out of their comfort zone. As data yeah. scientists, we like do it so naturally for us. We're so used to change because that's all we do in our job is change. The technology is changing. Yeah. The libraries are changing. Everything changes daily with data mm-hmm. techniques. Yeah. Um, so it's going through and getting everybody on the same sort of level that we're on and pushing them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, can you share something specific like – um, example, how did you, um, convince your, um, stakeholders? Yeah. Like I've had people that have told me how I'm going to innovate, um, mm-hmm. where they, like I've come in, that's a, that's a problem I've had where they, they're going to tell me how to innovate where they're yeah. like, this is what you're doing. And I go, well, I'm hired in as an expert, like a knowledge expert. My job is I'm, giving you advice. You're not giving me. That's why you hired me. And they want to tell me how they're going to build out like things. Um, Like I've had issues like with this when I worked on like the fraud side where they're like, this is what Mm -hmm. we're doing. And then it's like, so usually I negotiate with them in the crawl phase. So it's like, we're at stage one crawl. So we're going to, I'm going to take what you want to do and I'm going to do some of it, but not all of it. And then Mm. that will at least gain their trust when I show that that works. And it's part of your idea. It's also part of my idea. We kind of like came together and then walk. I'm like, sorry, move over. Like, you know, (laughs) this is like, I've proven myself. I know what I'm doing here. I have buy-in from like, you know, Mm -hmm. the, the, whoever's the, like, your chief security officer, your CISO. Mm-hmm. So like, I'm going to go through and like, make sure that I have everything aligned with them. And this is what I'm doing. Um, because at the end of the day, when you do consulting, you have a lot of people with personal interests on the business side and you have to maintain everybody's personal. It's like a, a balancing act between everybody that you meet Cause you're going to have yeah. a lot of different stakeholders and they're all going to have personal things that they're going to get from your stuff. So you got to make mm-hmm. sure that 
one person is not driving all of your um, everything you're doing out of all your stakeholders. Otherwise, you'll build them up and then you'll have one happy stakeholder. And like out of like the five, four will be unhappy. So you have to make sure that you're getting everybody's opinion on what they want to do, but also Mm -hmm. pushing for that innovation. You have to you have to continually push educate. I mean, that's a key thing, educating on what things are, putting it in yeah. simplest terms, um, making everybody feel like they understand data science. Because mm-hmm. for a lot of people, it's very scary. It They think of yeah. like a data scientist as like a hardcore statistician mm-hmm. with like, you know, like this, they have a lot of businesses have this unicorn perspective of data scientists that don't exist. You know what I mean? Yeah. Not everybody can know everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So you got to take it down to their level so they understand, like, listen, we're not these mythical creatures. We're people <laughs> like you with jobs. And yeah. let me explain and break it down so, you know, like a three-year-old could understand. So everybody understands what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's so important. I think part of data scientist's job is to educate people and also the capability of explaining something complex to something simple um, is also uh, crucial because it doesn't matter how good your model is. If people don't understand it, they don't trust it, then maybe they don't want to use it, right? What does it mean for the business? Yeah. So um, say after you have uh, uh, iterate the model, um, earn trust from the stakeholder uh, during the phase when you communicate with them um, on the final stage to decide whether the model is good enough. Um, can you tell us about that process? Yeah. Um, so the innovation is I always take the current model and benchmark it against the one that I'm building because sometimes Mm -hmm. like I've had instances where you build a model, it looks great. You move it in production, the production data breaks happen and it actually performs worse than before. Mm -hmm. Um, That's when you have to work quickly because you're, especially if you're in the crawl phase, because you're working to innovate, not roll things backwards. You know what I mean? They don't want to see that innovation doesn't work. So you have to work quickly to remodel, but you have to be transparent to say, listen, we're having issues. There's unforeseen sort of um, things that we did not think would happen with production Mm -hmm. data. It's very different than the sample we pulled, which happens. I mean, that's why it's a sample and not the population, Um, you know, especially during COVID, like all your data is so all over the place that when you hit production, it's very difficult to make sure that you're actually adding that incremental value. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure that you're using, and that's why I start with simple approaches because simple is reliable. Um, I'm not going to go in and be like, Hey, I'm building a bi-directional LSTM for my first Mm -hmm. model. Yeah. Like I would, if I was a person and someone came to me, I'm like, are you crazy? Like you need (laughs) something foundational to start with. Yeah. Yeah. To, you know, and I always benchmark like, okay, if I had not, like, what do I currently have here? Sometimes it's nothing. So then it's like, okay, well, if I have random, am I doing better than random? Mm -hmm. I always use it as my first benchmark. Then I do the regression, then I slowly build up. But that's how I always innovate. It's always Mm -hmm. incremental innovation. You know, I always think of like the Tesla car, you know, it's it's a self-driving car, but they didn't, when they first built it out, they didn't have all the features they had today. They focused on each thing and incrementally made it bigger. Same thing with Apple, like the iPhone, like they focus Mm -hmm. on each thing and incrementally get better. You can't boil the ocean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's a, uh, great framework to build an iterate model. So uh, after the model is built uh, with your benchmark, how do you um, kind of present your work to the uh, business? What are some kind of uh, key points you want to hit when you communicate with the business? So this, yeah. So when you're dealing with the business and dealing with people like I've dealt where you're like on the phone with like the CISO or the COO of a a Fortune 500 company, Mm -hmm. they're not going to care about your you know, AUC, like, you know, you're not going to go up and be like, this was my AUC of my model. (laughs) 
They're going to be like, what am I looking at? I don't understand this chart. And what is AUC? So you have to put things in business terms that they're, so you have to understand the first thing I always like do is understand who you're presenting to. What is their knowledge? Mm. Some people are very technical. You'll go like, if you're presenting to like someone who hired you and they're like a, they came from a stats background or something. I've I've had that where they're going to dive very technical. They'll want to see the AUC, but most like 85% of the time, you're not going to see that. You're going to see someone who wants to see like more of the business metric side. So you say like, okay, Mm -hmm. our current model performs at this. Here's now side by side, like here's our model we just built. So now it's like, okay, we can see like, let's say we're looking in marketing and we're, okay, the conversion rate, that improved, this improved, Mm -hmm. revenue improved, this improved, anything that you can attach to the model that like of those business metrics, like from here to here to show it went Mm -hmm. and increased, even if it's like a little bit is a huge win because sometimes a little bit when it's like, oh, this may not seem like a lot when it goes and it like goes out longer over a season or something, it adds up and compiles. Yeah, uh, that's a great approach. So the thing is, when you just build a model, you don't have that launched in production. So how do you know you have that impact um, on like revenue? Do you just run a kind of simulation, a scenario? There are a lot of like, I've done some scenario based, but a lot of times what I'll do is I'll back test. So I'll run my model on historical data and show how their current model Mm. runs at that time and then show my model how it runs. It's a little difficult when you're in the fraud space because historical data is like you're already too late. You're you're too late. Like Mm -hmm. today should be tomorrow because you're trying to get ahead of like fraudsters. So when you're in that space, you want to make sure that you're actually like as close as you can. So usually I'll actually set aside a sample of current production data um, Mm -hmm. and run it on that. So I'll like, even like while I'm building the model on today, I'll be ready to like test the model on tomorrow and pull a subset of that as like a different. Um, But in a lot of retail and demand planning and other things, areas, um, of forecasting, it's a lot of back testing. So it's taking your data and shifting it backwards and seeing how it performs. And in COVID it's become like very small, your window. So you've been like moved your window mm-hmm. and your, your horizon is a lot smaller. So it's, it's taking it and looking at things on a smaller sort of time scale and comparing like usually season over season, um, of things to understand because, you know, every right now it's like, you know, if you go to order something on the retail side and let's say I'm ordering for winter, I mean, honestly, winter's still sitting out there for a lot of companies. So it's like, Mm -hmm. you're going to see this influx of product in the, in summer of winter jackets. Thanks for sharing that. And uh, so for your previous uh, machine learning projects, what are the big ch- biggest challenge you have faced? Uh, the biggest challenge is, is obvi- it's always the data. Always mm-hmm. the data is the biggest challenge. So not only like the, the structure of the data, the quality of the data, um, and like also the amount of the data. Mm-hmm. A lot of times um, people want to do machine learning on like, the head of a pin and it's like you you don't have enough data to learn like you know what i mean yeah. it's not going to do well and then they're like mm. well i just saw it's like a silver bullet um so like that's always a challenge the other challenge is like always um with any stakeholders it's always going to be um politics with understanding motives for things like why are people Mm. doing this? Why do they need it? What's the context and motives behind things? Um, That's always a huge, huge issue. Another issue that I always run into with um, like machine learning type models is the deterioration. Um, Mm. You have to figure out when are you going to rebuild because your model is going to have a certain learning rate and eventually that learning rate is going to be like null next to nothing. Yeah. Um, And that's what people need to understand. Machine learning isn't, we built this model and we're done. It's, we built this model and now we have to prepare to rebuild a model to replace it, either better Mm. or the same. 
but with different yeah. components. But it's it's some way you have to keep innovating. Otherwise, your models will just not perform well. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So I think one that's one of the mistakes sometimes people make. They think it's just a one-time thing and then deliver it. And then sometimes the uh, if engineers take over, uh, you don't communicate with them. And if they see this not working, it get abandoned. And exactly. uh, you, you know if you don't follow up, all the time you spend. You know, it becomes a waste of your uh, resources, and then it becomes useless for the business. So it's very important to think about the continuation of this uh, machine learning model, and it doesn't have to be the data scientist doing all the work, right? Like you exactly. mentioned, set up the the processes, um, documents, and uh, identify the the point of failure, so you have uh, remedies. Um, so yeah, that's uh, I'm glad you mentioned that. And what are some other mistakes people make in kind of the machine learning cycle? Um, one thing is they always, I mean, usually with machine learning, the the first thing people always make a mistake of is they um, they try. A lot of people I see out there run in, and this is just an experience thing. I think they they haven't had enough of like falling down for this to happen where. They go for the most advanced thing out there. Like for me, it's like, how about we shoot for the moon, not for the stars? You know what I mean? Like I'm more of a realist. Yeah. Like what is actually going to get in production? What is actually approved? Like if you're dealing with regulators, what is mm -hmm. usable and what is transparent? Because I'm not going to be putting a total black box model out there and end up like a Apple credit card where it's discriminating yeah. against women. Like mm -hmm. that's why you can't black like black box things. You have to make right. sure that you're very transparent in things. And so that's mm -hmm. that's one area where people think machine learning is almost like a dumpster. You just dump it in and it's silver bullets shoots it out. And it's like, no, this isn't it's not that way. You have to understand what's going in. You have to understand what's going out and you have to understand what the model is doing during. Yeah. Um, thanks for sharing that. And, um, so what are some mistakes you have made, um, in your career? Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> uh, plenty of mistakes. I mean, I wear them with badges of honor because they're honestly things that I've learned. Um, yeah. there's, I mean, they've, they, they're the reason why I, know a lot of the things that I know. Um, so they're like things from early on in my career that I've learned not only for myself, but watching others. When you see somebody else put something in production and it fails, I was always the first one trying to understand why is it failing? Because if it's failing for them, uh, same thing probably will happen to me in my career. So I need to understand. Yeah. Um, but also like, well, what do you do in like quant research? Like when you have, let's say you invest a lot of time in exploring a data source or exploring something that you think has signal because in the quant research space a lot of times you're dealing with the unknown you are tethered to a rope going into the darkness not knowing anything and so you're navigating this area that most of the business they hired you because they don't know anything about this area so you have to map it out like you have to navigate you have to understand, but then you do all this work and you realize like, oh, none of this actually adds any signal or any value to the model. What do I do? I've had that happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to figure out like, okay, well, I've had this go back and take it and say, you know, because you have to remember when you do hypothesis testing, not everything is going to be HO is correct. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. You are always going to be correct. Um, no, that's hypothesis testing. But what did we learn? We learned that this is not something to be used and for other data scientists to stay away from this data set. It will add nothing for them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's no yeah. information. It's just solid noise, um, you know, which could be from the data quality or maybe the platform engineers that are building out this, this sort of data source are not ready yet. So you have to give them time and say, okay, we're going to, we're going to put a pin in this and we're going to circle back to this later when they are yeah. and pick it back up. Or mm -hmm. are they making changes to fix the issues in this data source that we're trying to integrate? Yeah. 
Another thing is on the quant research side, I found a paper. This is great. This is going to add a lot of value. You go through and you build it out and you realize like, no, it doesn't add any value. Mm -hmm. This paper is really good in a theoretical construct, but it's not good in actuality. Well, at least we can say avoid this paper. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This paper is not good. And when in doubt, use a sounding board. I mean, I, I always do that. And that's things I've picked up from working across the years. If you don't know, go and either talk to your mentor or, you know, like I have different mentors. I've got like one on the business side. I've got one on the technical side. Um, go talk to them, talk to your peers, talk to others, read down these ideas off and see what they say. If everybody was in the same boat and it blows up, mm-hmm. at least you can say everybody would have done the same as me. I'm no different. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great advice. So um, how did you find your mentors? Um, my mentors were very interesting. I've met some very interesting people that like where people wanted me to in interview to be their mentor or their mentee and i'm just like that's that's like weird like an interview <laughs> process being a mentee but i've had that where they they wanted yeah. to i mean for me it's somebody that for my mentors i found people i admire mm-hmm. so people that do really well and i've got people on so i have different mentors i've got one very technical mentor i mean he i mean it's the smartest person i've ever met Um, everybody that's ever met him agrees. And if I ever need modeling or like, I've never dealt with this situation, what do I do? I go directly to him. Like, Mm -hmm. uh, and and, like that mentor for me is Fernando Saladias. He is like the smartest person you will ever meet. Like when I first met him, people used to refer to him as the walking brain and he would go to his desk and he would have all these abstract books on models and things. And he was just applying and doing amazing stuff. And always like so on point with everything he did. Very thoughtful, very good, um, mm-hmm. like amazing stuff. And then on the business side, it's like, well, where do I want to go in my career? What story do I want to tell? How do I want to get to the next level? You have to understand that because your career, you need someone to help coach you and mentor you there, but you also need a technical mentor too. So like yeah. on that side, it's Afshin Afshar. He's like my mm-hmm. go-to and he is like one person I've admired throughout his career. From my fr- when I first met him in the room, there was like this aura he gives off of like just mm. success. And yeah, I've just met with him. And with mentors, people try and make a relationship that's very like um, almost like very formal. For me, I keep it very informal. I go and meet them for yeah. coffee and mm. like talk to them and just – am real. Like they're, you know, I don't treat them like a book I'm reading. I treat them like an actual individual person. Cause some people yeah. do that. They like only, they think a mentor is somebody you go to only when you need something. For me, mm-hmm. a mentor is something that somebody that becomes a confident for you. Yeah. And you can mm. have this problem at work. I don't know what to do. Can you help me with this? Or what are you currently doing? How's your family? Um, you know, you're building a house. Like, how's that going? Like, you know, all these sort of, those are things you talk about with them. You don't always have to talk data science. And that's the secret to networking great. Like I've been known as like the great networker in like everybody I've met. And the secret is, is you just talk to people like they were a normal human at a coffee shop behind you in line. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and so that's kind of like, you get to know them, you treat them like a person, you take them out for coffee, you just have a very casual conversation because not everybody always wants to talk about work. And that's Mm -hmm. what keeps things, you know, a mentee mentor relationship keeps things going. And I've had these mentors for years now. Um, and they've been like amazing people to work with. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, that's awesome. I think it's important to have both a technical mentor and mentor on the business side. So I uh, definitely want to um, ask more about uh, those mentors impact. And the one thing uh, reminds me that some a lot of times people ask me, 
like, can I mentor them? Um, I just don't have the capacity. And then there's something I always recommend and my friend use. It's a, a service. It's a company called Sharpest Mind. So they have, uh, they mentor you through taking you through, um, data science projects. So we'll build something on GitHub together with them and it's free. Uh, you don't get to, you don't pay them until, uh, you find a job. I think you give them a small percentage and, uh, uh, I will link the company in the uh, show notes, um, just as a side recommendation. So yeah, to uh, circle back on the tech mentor, Fernando, I'm very curious, this uh, walking brain, what are some things that you learned from him that you can share with us? Oh my God, the things I have learned from Fernando is crazy. And everybody, if anybody's watching this and they know Fernando, they know that Fernando's desk is like the coolest for, for me. It's like going to the toy store as a data scientist, you get all these books and you're like, what is this? He's like, well, I'm using this genomic medical process for something in time series. And you're like, who would even think of this? Like, this is amazing. Like out of the box earthquake simulations for like, mm-hmm. you know, detecting volatility, all kinds of crazy stuff. And it's like mm-hmm. the best form of crazy. Cause he's so technical. And one of the things that, I used to love is we used to do this thing where we would do like paired programming where he'd sit down and cause I wanted to learn. So I would, I would sit at his desk and um, he would st- do, do all this crazy stats and math. Like on like his pencil was literally smoking on a, a large piece of paper and he was like, okay, we need to build this. So go up here and he would just guide me like, Hey, go up mm-hmm. here and here's what we're going to do. There's this function. A lot of people don't know about it. Use this. Okay. Uh, and I would be coding and he would be kind of driving, um, like d- telling me where to go. And wow. I would just be sitting there going. And I, I learned so much from doing that from him. Um, mm-hmm. And also he'd let me work on like side. I've always had side projects at companies. Mm-hmm. Like when I've been like um, working, not in consulting, but uh, like when I've been in a, like a full-time capacity, sort of like, you know, full-time employee of a company, I've always gone out and found projects I can learn from outside of my daily work because those usually are where you can learn and add those into the work you're currently doing. And Fernando is one of those people. And I just met him and was like, I just have to like, like meet this person and hang out with this person. And he's, he's always really funny too. Um, he, he's just like a really great person. He knows a lot of great, like just modeling techniques that are just crazy, crazy, like things you would never think of. It's just made a lot of difference because I, I put these bookmarks in like, and I have these like Fernando resources of like (laughs) things. And it's like a little folder I've had. And I just sometimes, and I do come back to a project where I'm like, Oh my God, Fernando was doing this. Mm -hmm. I could use the same technique and this would like add so much value. And it's a lot of Fernando's stuff. I, I, and that's what I learned was the small, incremental stuff he would do so mm-hmm. it'd be like a really cool thing it'd be a very small feature you add in but it would make such a difference wow can you share some specific examples there was this other book and it was life-changing on how mm-hmm. you think of things um so it was more of modeling from the behavioral um perspective so let's mm-hmm. say you have a current product and you want to see how a similar product could substitute in. It's really good for like substitutional analysis. So like if you're looking at a competitor or another product that's similar, you'll be able to use this um, like technique to go through and actually build out these sort of like uh, models. And the models were like, I was like, oh, this is like really good and I'll be able to possibly use this down the road, but I don't know when. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I actually like use that. And I actually felt uh, like met one of my clients was just, she is she was like another very, very smart person. Um, probably the, the best person I've, the client I've ever worked with. Um, and she moved on to another company, but she's like still a legend. Um, like Jessica Guo, she's, she's like amazing. And she used to use this in like traffic optimization of transportation and other things. And, um, yeah, like I thought I would never use that book 
at all. And then I met her and she's used it before that same book. And I was like, oh, you've read this book too. Oh my gosh. And then working on a market substitution project, it was like amazing. Like, you know, yeah. that's where you can use uh, this sort of um, stuff. I'm blanking on the technique right now. I don't know why. Cause it's like, mm-hmm. I was just talking about this yesterday to somebody. Yeah. Um, that's okay. You'll come back to me. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, we will find a book and then link in the notes. So for on the business side, uh, this business mentor, um, Ashi, can you tell us what are some lessons you learned from him? Yeah, I mean, Ashin is just like a book of knowledge and lessons. I mean, he mm-hmm. was originally a doctor. Yeah, uh, so he was a an, um, a neuroscientist, flipped to data science. So he is just like, he worked at Goldman Sachs as, and he was like really high up. And then he went to JP Morgan Chase where he was the chief data science officer for uh, consumer investment bank. And um, a lot of people were, um, when I first met Afshin, it was in a room um, of, we were talking about data science tooling in the firm. And he was just like very well spoken, very well put together, very knowledgeable. And so I just reached out to him. It was like, hey, can I just have like 15 minutes of your time? I just want to like talk. And um, yeah, like he just has a presence. And you see how he conducts himself with other people, his level of professional, like professionality with everybody and his knowledge. And it, it's just like on the business side, it was like, this is somebody that I would strive to be in my career. And that's how I chose him. Yeah. And he gives mm-hmm. great advice on like, not only like anything, like when people look at your resume, people worry about gaps. They worry about, cause you, when you naturally, we always pick ourselves apart. It's something that we, we all do. We put ourselves mm-hmm. down. Yeah. And like one thing Ashin talks about is like, you need to see every flaw as an opportunity of enhancement on yourself. So this is either an area like you can learn, like, you know, where do you have a gap? Go learn it. And then you don't have a gap. You don't have to be amazing at it, just enough to cover, you know, mm. that hole and then you're fine. Other things are if you have blemishes in your resume of things that you're like, let's say you took a sabbatical or something, you write your own story on your own life. Your resume Mm -hmm. is that story. So how you tell things is how you tell the story of who you are, how your career is, and you're the one writing your story. So don't let people write your story in a different way. Always correct them and tell them, no, this is what actually is because yeah. you're the one that went through it, not other people. So even if you think it's a blemish on your resume, it couldn't, it could just be a hidden diamond and you, you dust it off and underneath the dust is actually something that propels your career. Yeah. Like I thought having a degree in horse reproduction and being a pro athlete at one time would do absolutely nothing for me. It, uh, this is irrelevant in data science. I'm never going to use that. Yeah. Honestly, every time I submit my resume out of everything on there, that is the first thing anybody ever brings up. Mm -hmm. I saw your resume and even I just had to talk to you about this. Yeah. Like not even, you know, the Harvard degree, any, anything like that. It was all just the, the, how do we like understand what is this horse reproduction you did? Like you were a pro athlete, like what is Mm -hmm. this? Like what's going on? And you work in data science? And those are the best, like, I feel like those are the best things that you may think are like, those aren't important, remove that from your resume. But those Mm -hmm. are the things that set you apart from other people. Because you got to understand, when you, let's say, apply for a job. Nowadays, the data science market is so competitive. There's easily like 400 people with the same resume that looks identical to yours. How do you Mm -hmm. set yourself apart is like the huge thing. And those blemishes Afshin taught me are like, those are your like diamonds, rubies, and sapphires on your resume. Those are like the things people look for when they're mining resumes, because those are the things that say like, this person has different experience. You know, people don't want to hire the same person as them. They want to hire someone different. You know what I mean? So that's like where people look for those. Like what is different? What is something that you've done on your resume that sets you apart 
that is different from what they do and such. Yeah, thanks for sharing that.、Um, I think that's kind of your X factor. There's something special about you, and、uh, when you can have that conversation with someone hiring you, you also have good rapport with them. And、uh, you know, if they think you're interesting, they like you, they might. Um, you know, want to learn more about you?、Um, maybe you know, just give you more opportunities in a in a hiring process. I mean, of course, you have to have good technical skills, but this is what set you apart from like a thousand other candidates with exactly the same resume. Yeah, and that usually comes down to it when there's like, let's say, four candidates left.、Mm. You know, who is this? When it comes down to like. A lot of people don't realize interviewing is the same way as like dating in a way. Yeah, you know what I mean, like. Who do you want to work with, like de- every day? Because you spend how many hours a week at work? You're、yeah. not going to choose somebody that you can't stand or something. So、yeah. a lot of people like don't take like I, I I always see this quote and I use it a lot. Like don't take rejection as rejection. Take it as redirection. You、mm-hmm. know what I mean? Something、yeah. better. But like you, sometimes you are clearly the best qualified candidate. But you and the person interviewing, you just didn't match. Like it happens, you know. Like,、yeah. so、uh, you you also mentioned that this mentor helped you grow from a to a, you know next level of your career. So how did you grow to、uh, staff and then later you know principal level? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was a huge jump, and I climbed really quickly. And the way I climbed was honestly、um, learning from my mistakes was one. Like if、mm. when I would trip or fall, I would pick myself up. I would say, "What did I do wrong?" I'm always I'm a very、yeah. introspective person, so I always try and improve. I'm always trying to、mm. better myself、um, from my experiences, good, bad. I always take out like and pick things apart.、Um, like how can I make myself better? How can I learn from this experience? How can I go out there and improve? And、um, going through like when you have like it, you know, like going from a, a, a senior staff to like you know, going from senior to senior staff to principal, it's all your level of influence,、uh, your ability to get buy-in from people, your technical knowledge, of course. Um, especially when you're a knowledge expert, you always got to keep all your knives very sharp, like a sushi chef. But you also have to like push yourself. So,、mm-hmm. like for me, I'm always pushing myself to perform at the level above. So,、yeah. like, how do I? If I want to be a principal, why not start being a principal now?、Mm. You know what I mean? Like in the、yeah. way that I, you know, I'm not overstepping where I'm like stepping on my manager and you know anything like that. But I'm acting with the job requirements already, so that way I'm learning. So when I do get into that position, I can succeed, and then that sets you for okay. Now I am a principal. How do I become the next level? Like you know what I mean? Like so now it's、mm-hmm. like going up and setting yourself up for that next level. And learning those things. Yeah, that's a great mindset. And also, in my promotion processes, I know people also evaluate you. Say、uh, you are a you know a junior level. You want to go to the next level. People want to see whether you are already performing at the next level. So that's how you grow. And also,、um, I know some. Other great data scientists, when they're at a certain level, they will set higher standard for themselves at the next level, right? Even if you just join the company, you might not get promoted to a senior or you know staff immediately. But you can ask your manager, what is the requirement? What is expected for the next level? So、exactly. then you can learn, and then right, and then you you can、um, also. Use that as a standard for your current project, and then on、um, you know build your influence,、um, uh, work on high impact project, and then also when you have this type of conversation, your manager is more likely to think about you when、uh, they try to assign data science on project, right? Like oh, this person wants to grow, let's put them on a challenging project, and that's how you grow. Yeah, and that that's one thing I have to say I love about tech systems. It's very 
different where Wall Street is very rigid in how things work, where mm-hmm. consulting is very like fluid in a way. Like you go into a meeting like uh, like for career and stuff and they're like, well, what do you want to do? We have all mm-hmm. these like clients. We have all these domains. We have all these positions available. Are you ready to be a principal? If so, yeah. like we can prep you and get you ready. Like, what do you want to do though? You know what I mean? Like, do you want to stay yeah. go in a management track? Do you want to go in a technical track? Like that's, there's different tracks out there and you can crisscross it. You know, no one has the same career. It's just, yeah. where do you want to go and how do you get there? Mm. And that's like yeah. the standards you have to set where you just like, okay, what do I need to get? Like for me, what do I need to get to the next level? I have to like, you know, like slowly get better and better and better in different aspects. You know, Mm. it's not just about coding or one specific thing in, in data science, you know, there's, there's very different, like there's very different factors that come into your career than just the software engineering side or the machine learning side. There's a lot of different areas under, you know, if you're weak in decision sciences, pick up a book and start learning. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of different decision theories out there and like people are like, well, how did you learn? Well, the way I learned decision theory came from actually my horse reproduction background Mm -hmm. because decision theories rooted in biostats. And so I remember learning that in some of my courses, like, well, you do a scientific method thing, but you have these decision sciences at the end, which are kind of like, well, how do we decide if this is correct or not? And that's where yeah. one place I always tell people, if you want to learn decision sciences, the best place is to go find pharmaceutical research papers of drug mm-hmm. vaccines and stuff. Always have yeah. told them that because that's what they do. They have to prove, does this vaccine work? Does it not? There's a control, there's mm-hmm. tests. They go through and they break it all down on what you need to know to do experimental design and decision sciences because that's their job, their bread and butter. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. And then that's when you connect the dots, when you're looking back, right? So exactly. even if you feel like, oh, I'm doing something irrelevant, maybe that will be useful in the future, right? Have a curiosity and do well and learn as much as you can. Yeah, um, exactly. So um, you struck me as someone with a very good uh, people skill. Is this something you always have or you develop throughout your career? I think I developed it throughout my career, uh, to be honest. Like I, I was like in my teenage years and in high school, I was very um, kind of like introverted loner in a way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then when I went to college, I wanted to change that. Because I remember, like, m- like I grew up with my grandma, who my grandma was the most amazing person ever. She could talk to anybody, anybody. And, like, she was just like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Like, this is such a skill, like, to have, yeah. to be able to go up and talk to anybody, strike a conversation, and then, like, like... One of my favorite stories of my grandma that influenced me like so much is she was in Italy with my older brother and my aunt and they were in Tuscany and um, they saw the writer of Under the Tuscan Sun like they were driving by and my grandma wanted to meet her and people are like, you're crazy. My grandma literally threw herself off the bus. Wow. Like it was still moving when she got off. Um and she ran up to her <laughs> and was like, hi, I'm Rosalie like, Landy. And this is like, you know, everything about me. I love your book. I've read everything. I feel like we have so much in common and stuff like that. And what do you know? They became pen pals. Wow. Like, that was like what struck me. And when I got into like, I was always like, wow, I want to be able to walk in a room and like be able to talk to anybody. Cause I used to be the mm-hmm. opposite where I would walk in the room and crawl up in the corner and be like, I'm too shy. I'm too nervous. Yeah. And so I wanted to be able to be somebody like that. And mm-hmm. so I've worked on putting myself out there and the easiest way. And a lot of people, um, when I was in banking was don't fixate yourself on a title whatever title you're at, who cares? I mean, 
everybody's going to be a title of whatever in their career. What you need to do is like, I really admire that person. I want to talk to them, talk to them because chances are no one talks to them because you know, when you get high up, a lot of times people get scared. They're intimidated. Yeah. Don't be, we're all people mm-hmm. at the end of the day. If we went into a coffee shop and we didn't have name tags on, chances are you would not know half the people in there if you would be surrounded by like tech gurus or whatever. Yeah. So just treat people like that. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a great story. Um, and uh, so say now, um, if you mentor someone uh, earlier or mid in their career, what would be your best advice for them? When you're early in your career, I was always given a great recommendation from Afshin where he said, spend a lot of time on the bottom, which means Mm -hmm. don't rush into management. Management will always be there. That director, senior director, distinguished engineer position, that will always be there for you. Mm -hmm. You know, what you need to do is make sure you can be a data scientist and be it well be well versed in different areas, domains, so you're very malleable. So when you get a problem, wow. you, you can take other things and put them into that problem mm-hmm. and solve it. So he said, don't rush because a lot of people rush and then they fall. You want to make sure that you rush only like the only thing I would rush is learning. Like I'm constantly yeah. learning. So mm-hmm. like, I always am like, okay, well, what makes up a data scientist? You have quant skills, you have software engineering skills, you have ML skills, you have decision sciences, you have the business side, you have data engineering. Do I feel comfortable in doing all those things? And how do I improve those? Can I build a successful project start to finish and mm-hmm. slowly start getting your self ready, like, okay, now I'm comfortable enough to start looking at my career where I want to become a senior. What do I have to do to become a senior? I've had two, three positions as a regular. I'm obviously ready, well ready to start climbing. And if you put enough time at the bottom, you're eventually going to hit that influx point where you're just going to go boom and shoot up. And like, that's what happened to me because I've had, I understand what happens on the ground floor, you know? Mm -hmm. You have to understand what the yeah. janitor does in order to run operations. Yeah, that's a, that's a great piece of advice um, because growth is not linear. And, uh, and also yeah. the level, how much knowledge you have is not like, a, you know, just linearly correlated to the title you have and be sometimes you need to be patient. I think also going back to, I think, under the LinkedIn post uh, uh, I wrote, we talk about sometimes data scientists feel frustrated they got hired into the wrong role and they want to do machine learning, but hire into a role that uh, requires uh, business intelligence or data engineering and people are frustrated. And also sometimes recruiters are kind of confused of those roles. They don't know what the team are actually looking for. So for uh, folks that are in a role that they don't feel they're doing exciting things um, what, what's your advice for them? So for them, I, and I've met people like this and I've helped them move into data scientist roles where mm-hmm. I've met them and they've been building dashboards or something because a lot of times people yeah. don't know what data science is, but they want a data scientist. So then yeah. you get in that role and you discover it's either a data engineering role or a BI engineering type role. And that's not mm-hmm. what you wanted. So my thing is learn as much as you can not only from the business context of that job, but start networking out there with someone. If you are in a position and you know it's not a good fit, like in the position, like I'm clearly ready for a data scientist role. um, And I chose this offer and I got stuck with it. Like I would find somebody that could either transfer you in the company you're at, because I've done that with people, help them move to different teams and Mm -hmm. stuff to further their career, or if they're not quite ready, but you want to, well, if you want to get a job as let's say an ML engineer and just do ML all day, like in and out, that's all you want to do and put things in production. What skills do I need to have to do that? So what do I, what do I always do? I look at job boards. You should always be in touch with the market because those are the skills. 
So I go out there and I go and I go to Google and say, okay, if I want to be a machine learning engineer at Google or Amazon or Facebook or any of the, the top companies out there, what do I have to do to know, okay, well, these are the skills they say I need. Well, let me start learning those. And then I start Googling and I get a book. And I always start with a book because a book is like, you'll get all these like things in a book, but a lot of times you'll come across something that will open up another door to another. Mm -hmm. like, you'll start picking apart. Like I'll go through a chapter and be like, I don't know what this is. Okay, Google it. I don't know what this is. Google it. And eventually you'll get so much, you'll probably know more than the person who wrote the book. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I think nowadays with, you know, Twitter and uh, Medium, a lot of people don't read books anymore, but uh, be patient. And then the book is really put into kind of a knowledge system. You can dive deep into that. It's not just some snippets. Yeah, exactly. And it's like putting yeah. those together. The, the book is more of like the theoretical side usually and putting the blog posts and the medium articles and uh, such with them is the area where you connect what you're learning in the book with like what's actually happening. Cause a lot of times you'll find out that the book was actually wrong. Yeah. And, uh, uh, so how do you see yourself in say five or 10 years? Um, how do you want to grow your career? I mean, I, I, uh, five years in this market and data science, I swear you can't tell where you are in five years. I mean, yeah. when I started as a data scientist, I literally thought that was it. It really was a struggle mm -hmm. for me because when you want to be a data scientist so badly and then you become a data scientist, well, where do you go next? It was almost like a, a career crisis in a way. I didn't know what, like, what do you do? Like data science, that's it. No, there's all these, especially nowadays, there's all these specialties out there. I mean, look at me, I, quant yeah. scientist, quant researcher, uh, machine learning engineer, there's decision scientist, there's, there's so many roles out there. For me, I would love, I mean, I would love to get up to that chief data science officer position. That's always been my, my go-to, mm -hmm. but the interim, the interim plan is I would love to keep diving in on the, the knowledge expertise sort of side of things and learning because I learned so much just in the time as a quant researcher about quant research and everything about it, how to use it and apply it. I would love to dig into the decision sciences side and learn more of like the behavioral side of data science mm -hmm. um, of like the computational social science stuff and dig or dig deeper in that and slowly get up to that like director, senior director, distinguished engineer. Like that's what I'm pushing for. Like those mm -hmm. upper level sort of positions. Yeah, that sounds very exciting. So um, before we wrap up, what do you think about the future of data scientists work on the machine learning space? Yeah, I mean, with the future of it, there's a lot of interesting applications out there. And I think if you want to do machine learning, you can do machine learning. You can do it on almost anything right now. Like I was watching Nova last night and they were doing it. They had this really cool, um, episode on eagles and the interesting thing was a lot of people don't know and i didn't know this but eagles a lot of them die by hitting wind turbines because they apparently their mm -hmm. vision they can't see up they only see down because of their eyebrows yeah. um so they run into the blades and so they used wow. um like they they built these cameras similar to like a google car where it goes out there and it does image detection of eagle like um, so it will identify the shape of an eagle from the, like the cameras. And then it has mm -hmm. a camera that will zoom around and like look in and determine what, is this a crow or is this actually an eagle? It was fascinating. Yeah. But like, I think in the data science area, opportunities are only going to keep increasing and the market mm -hmm. is so hot right now for data scientists, you know, just don't rush into things and don't try and just do the coolest thing out there. Yeah. The mundane things are the things that most of the time you're going to spend most of your data science career doing like mm -hmm. data engineering, make sure, you know, data engineering, make sure, you know, basic like yeah. EDA pre-modeling, post-modeling decision science mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, when someone's going into put a model in production, make sure you're there to put things in production with them, sit and watch yeah. Just be the fly on the wall. 
because those are the learning areas. Always keep learning. Always keep pushing yourself forward. Yeah, that's、uh, such great advice. So, what's something currently you're excited about in your、uh, work or your life? Um. Well, for me, I mean, it's it's basically been like、uh, the most exciting thing has been getting things back to normalcy a little bit, which、mm. Omicron kind of like threw out the window. Yeah. Because originally we had a little bit of normalcy establishing here in New York City, and then it just with Omicron, like everybody just got COVID, and it just turned、yeah. New York City back upside down. And so, like that was the most exciting for me was going out and actually talking to people and meeting and socializing with people that I haven't met since before the pandemic. So that、mm-hmm. was one thing exciting. And the other excitement for me is travel. I love to travel, and so it was getting back out there to potentially have that and travel、mm-hmm. and start going around. And seeing things again, because that's like one of the most exciting things for me is going and putting yourself in someone else's culture and digesting it, and sitting back and understanding how people interact, what they do. For me, that's the most fascinating thing. Yeah, are you working on any side projects now? Yeah,、uh, like so, I have like some side projects. Like I work on MLOps World, which is more of a conference side project,、um, and that's one thing that I've been、uh, helping with quite a bit. Like stand up,、uh, like help stand up and get people like that. I know I know a lot of smart people, so getting them to talk at these conferences、mm-hmm. on topics that are relative to what they know and they're great at. Yeah. And then, like going out there and like making sure that the the conference is not just like people standing and talking, but there's actual demos, there's people being involved, and like there's a a full like I think if I wanted to go to a conference, what would I want? And that's like kind of what I just don't want big name speakers. I want to be able to interact.、Right. I want to be able to see demos and understand, and not、mm. only. Or like different vendors out there of new products I may have never heard of that could potentially be used down the road, but also like techniques. Seeing like someone PhD research that they've done and seeing、yeah. it work, you know, there in front of you is like a big thing than reading a paper.、Mm-hmm. So those are like、yeah. some th- like a big thing I've been working on. Other things I've just been doing a lot of like personal learning. Myself, like on different things,、um, upskilling, and、uh, mainly decision sciences has been an area I've been really like diving deep into lately,、mm-hmm. and learning information theory and like causal inference and other areas, and connecting that back to the knowledge that I know. Yeah.、Um, but yeah, that's like mostly been with COVID. It's like the I feel like the most of my previous excitement that I. Had about like、uh, things has kind of like stalled because it, you know you can't go out and meet people or you know it's harder to go and just go visit and talk to people one on one. I think. Yeah. Like、um, I can't go to the desk anymore and like sit down and pair program with them like that. Just doesn't work anymore. Yeah.、Um, well, I hope we can all you know travel internationally soon. And also, the things you learn is very exciting. I think when you Combine all those statistical、um, kind of、uh, knowledge, like causal inference, decision science, with machine learning and ML engineering, you're gonna have a, like a superpower. I think that would, you know, put you on the red、right、track of becoming a chief data officer someday. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Yeah.、Um, so yeah, for people who are interested in the conference,、um, you help organize.、Um, where can I find it? And also for people who want to like reach out to you,、um, keep up with your learning.、Um, um, where can I find you? Yeah. So I'm on LinkedIn. You can search and find me on LinkedIn. I, I usually add everybody unless you. Look like a robot, and you've got one friend, and have a really weird picture. Yeah, because there's a lot of those out there. But yeah, usually, yeah. I connect with everybody. If you're a student, if you're anybody, find me on LinkedIn.、Yeah. Um, you know, Daniel G. Landy, 
you can usually identify me by my picture. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll link your profile in the yeah. LinkedIn notes. And if you find him through this podcast, send him a note to tell him you like this podcast and what do you like. Yeah, about and always it. send a note. When, when you <laughs> yeah. find somebody on LinkedIn, don't just send a blind request. Send a note yeah. like, hey, I met you here or I know you from here or I mm. want to learn about this or can you point me in a direction of this? Because when yeah. you send me a, a blank note, you're networking, but you're not getting the full value of networking out. Mm -hmm. Uh, for MLOps, uh, the best way is you can you can look up and find MLOps world, like some of the, the stuff, not only online, but you can also find it um, on LinkedIn. There's some and like the, the person who runs it, he's an amazing guy in Toronto, um, David Sharbach. Like you can you can reach out to him on LinkedIn, too. He's like really he's very passionate about not only having speakers um, but like also having people participate and like just learning a lot more. He, he's a great guy. He's, he's put a lot of work into these. Yeah. Sounds great. Thanks for sharing that. And, uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. I learned so much. I'm going to go back and re-listen and, uh, um, yeah, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Yeah, no problem. Anytime. Thanks for having me.